Hallelujah. Shall we lift our hands to heaven, everybody, and give thanks to God? Give thanks to God in anticipation of his word that we're ready to receive today. I appreciate him and give glory unto him. Father, thank you for the blessing of the first word. I'm here to receive from you again. Speak directly to me by your word. Change me, transform me by your word this morning. Thank you, Father, for it. Blessed be your holy name. You are worthy of all the praise and of all the glory. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Yeah. For your word that has come to us in the first session, and for it we are grateful. Lord, we are before you again, and we ask that you speak to us. Yeah. By your word, let every one of us be changed and transformed. Yeah. We give you the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Yeah. Give Jesus a big hand and please you may be seated in his presence. Shiloh 2019. I'm breaking limits. This morning I want to first of all appreciate God and appreciate our Father for this privilege given unto me today to share God's word with us here in this hour of visitation. There is no doubt that for me personally and also for my siblings, we have been blessed not only to be instructed, but to be shown examples. It is the example that has made the difference in our lives. And therefore, I want to say thank you, son. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We are going to be continuing in the series of teachings that we began to explore as we heard in the first teaching this morning, understanding the faith that works. Understanding the faith that works. And let me begin by saying that, or reminding us yet again, that by redemption we are ordained to be limit breakers. We are not ordinary passerbys. By redemption, we are ordained for lives of impact. We are designed to break limits. We are designed to be pace setters, to be trail blazers. We are designed to be high flyers. Romans chapter 8 verse 19 down to verse 21 says that for the endless expectation of the creature, waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. He said, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. And in verse 21, we are told that because the creature shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So God makes it very clear that you are here to matter. Say with me, I'm here to matter. That means that you are not to be limited. You are not to be caged. You are not designed to be restricted. You have a limitless destiny. That is God's original design for you. And that design shall be exhibited through your life in the name of Jesus. But we've come to recognize that the destiny which Christ has created for us, this limitless destiny cannot be manifested without faith. It is faith that ushers us to a world of no limits. In the book of John chapter 14 and verse 12, we are told there Jesus speaking. He said, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go to my father. Jesus made it clear therefore, that the subject of faith is non-negotiable when it comes to breaking limits. Jesus was saying that there is no limit to a man who is operating in faith. There is no condition that can restrict a man or a woman that is operating by faith. When an individual is operating the force of faith, he dominates the forces of the earth. He supersedes the restrictions of the earth. I want you to think about this practically speaking. In science, we are made to understand that there is a pull called gravity. 
And gravity says that whatever attempts to go up must come down. There is a reason why you put a chair on the ground and you don't find it in the sky. Gravity is holding it to the ground. There's a reason why when you pick your leg up, it doesn't fly off. Gravity is still pulling it down. It is a force that is at work. But then there is a counter force called the force of uplift. That is the one by which planes are able to fly. That force says even though there is gravity, there is a higher one that can subject it. Now when faith is at work, there are forces that may be on the earth, but faith is, faith is a higher force that subjects it. Gravity says metals cannot fly, but the uplift says when this force is applied, it cancels the law of gravity. There are forces perhaps that may be holding many destinies in one way or the other down, but by the impartation of faith upon this mountain, every such force is cancelled in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Somebody believe me, say louder, amen. amen. That is why Jesus never told people, be it unto you according to your situation. He didn't tell them, be it unto you according to your condition. He didn't say, be it unto you according to the economy. He said, let it be unto you according to your faith. Your faith determines your lot when you are operating in faith you are operating above the laws that hold others down my prayer is that upon this mountain the impartation of faith you are receiving will take you beyond every limit amen. somebody believe it say loud amen. amen i said somebody believe it say loud amen. amen somebody believe it say the loudest amen, amen. That's what it's all about. So the force of faith is the force required to break limits in life and in destiny. It is the force required. But we must understand, like we're told in the first teaching, that it is not every faith that works. There are vital qualifications in scriptures for the faith that works. It's not enough to say, I have faith. Like we are told in the scriptures in the book of James chapter 2. He said, you have faith and I have works. He said, show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. So there are qualifications for your faith to get results. Faith is not by description. It is by manifestation. There are things that must prove the reality and the validity of our faith. There are people who will say, that you cannot see faith but Jesus made it very clear that any faith that is within will have evidence that is without when they brought the man from the roof who had been paralyzed Jesus saw their faith so there are qualifications for faith that will work and what we are looking at this morning is to see what kind of faith will work we are trying to understand the kind of faith that produces result. And we're looking at this order of faith in this teaching this morning, and that is dedication order of faith. It is dedication order of faith. This faith produces results on the basis of dedication. And I believe God that the Holy Spirit will grant each one of us understanding as we explore his word this morning. Dedication. First of all, we must recognize that by scriptural description, every child of God is described as a seed of Abraham. Galatians 3 and verse 29. The Bible makes us to understand there, it said that if we truly are Christ's, then we are Abraham's seed and we are heirs according to the promise. If we truly belong to Christ, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, then you have been designed as a seed. And we must recognize that when it comes to seeds, the value of any seed is in its planting. An unplanted seed is a valueless seed. The best it can be is simply an example of what a seed looks like, but it cannot produce results. If you put, you know, grains of corn on a table, 
Yes, they are grains of corn, but they can never reproduce on that table. Until they are planted, they are not permitted to reproduce. Inside of that grain of corn is the potential to produce other grains. Just like you have a seed of mango. Inside of that seed of mango is the capacity to produce other seeds. But until it is planted, it cannot produce. Ultimately, we actually discover that anything that is planted, what comes out of its planting is greater than what was planted. You cannot be planted as a seed and remain the size of the original seed. A mango seed is planted in the ground. When you look at the seed, it can be destroyed by a hammer. But when you plant it in the ground, the tree that comes, even if you use a hammer, you can only nail something to that tree. Because the tree is greater than the seed that was planted. We are born again and born as living seeds. But the greatness of our destiny is in our planting. That is why you discover that all through scriptures, one of the descriptions we see of God, is, of God with his children, is that we see him naming us his plantings. He said, they are the plantings of the Lord that his name may be glorified. So God is interested in seeing every one seed of Abraham being planted in order to bring forth results. It's not enough, therefore, to be born again. As one that is born again, you must now be planted. The process of the planting is what brings out the results that we desire. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. In the book of Isaiah 61 verse 3, we saw it there. He called us the plantings of the Lord. In Psalm chapter 1 verse 2 and verse 3, he said, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and his Lord doth he meditate day and night. He said, He shall be as a tree that is planted by the rivers of water. So we see all through the scripture, this admonition of being planted, being planted, being planted. In fact, the entire church is called God's husbandry. The ones God is planting and tending. The ones God is ensuring their rootedness so for a believer we must recognize that our qualification for our faith to work requires the process of our planting we look at the example of jesus in scriptures the bible shows us jesus exhibited as a seed in the book of john chapter 12 verse 23 and verse 24 look at jesus speaking very closely and jesus answered them saying the hour is come that the son of man should be glorified but what must happen he said except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die it abideth alone but if it die it brings forth much fruit this is Jesus showing, him, showing us his example. And we remember we are told in the book of Hebrews 12 and verse 2, he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So if Jesus had to be planted, then you and I must be planted. It is that planting that we are referring to as dedication. Now let's give it some definition from scriptures. What is dedication? What is dedication? dedication because we are saying that the one whose faith must work is the one who is dedicated but what does it mean to be dedicated number one it is deadly commitment to God and the affairs of his kingdom a deadly commitment to God and to the affairs of his kingdom Philippians chapter 2 we see the example of Jesus beginning from verse 5 down to verse 11 we are told there, he said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. He said, whom, he, he said, whom although he was made in the form of God, he taught it not to be rob, rob, taught it not robbery to be equal with God. He said, but made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the form of his servant and was made in the likeness of man. Look at verse 8. He said, I'm being formed in the fashion of of a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death 
even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him. There is no tree, no seed that can be wishing to be a tree on the table. It must be obey, obedient to the point of death in the ground. And when it goes down into the ground in dedication, it rises up in glory as a tree. So the beauty of everyone's destiny is in that deadly obedience. That deadly obedience. If you look at the book of John chapter 12 very closely, if you look at verse 25, Jesus gave us his own example in verse 23 and 24 when he said that except the corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abided alone. And verse 25 makes this very clear statement. He said, he that loveth his life shall lose it. He said, but he that hateth his life, he said, in this world, he shall keep it unto life eternal. Look at verse 26. He said in verse 26, if any man serve me, let him follow my example, that where I am, there also my servant shall be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. If you want to see the glorification of Jesus, you must follow the dedication of Jesus. The dedication is the pathway. You cannot claim to be dedicated without having this deadly commitment. When we talk about a deadly commitment, we are talking about commitment at the expense of comfort and convenience. We live in a convenience-driven world. Everything today is about convenience. It's about ease. It's about making things, as it were, simple and easy. But the Bible says that woe to them that are at ease in Zion. So if you want to get the best out of your Christian work, you cannot be at ease. You must be committed, you must be dedicated, you must, you must be willing to sacrifice convenience. That's what he was saying in that verse 25 of, of John chapter 12. He said, he that hated his life, the one that will not put himself at the place of prominence, he said in this world, he said he will gain it. The one who is committed to his convenience, he will lose out. So to make the most of our faith, we must be dedicated and that means having a deadly commitment to God and the affairs of his kingdom. Look at Paul's example in the book of Galatians 2 and verse 20. Paul speaking makes this statement. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. Look at the next statement. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Not just by faith, but by the order of faith that was in Christ. If you follow the dedication of Christ, your faith will walk towards the glorification of Christ. The same way Christ was glorified. If you follow his example of dedication then you find yourself enjoying the same order of glorification. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, I am crucified. And as a reason of that, the faith of Christ is the same order at work in me. No wonder that demon said to those seven sons of Sceva, he said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. They operate with the same stuff. He said, but you, who are you? You see, it is all about our dedication. There was a deadly commitment in Paul, and that deadly commitment provoked unusual results. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I see the grace for dedication coming afresh upon you today in the name of Jesus. Amen. You believe it, say louder, amen. amen. I say, you believe it, say louder, amen. amen. You believe it, say the loudest, amen. amen. I see that grace for dedication coming afresh upon your life in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Number two, it is placing God above all else, including self, in pursuit of his agenda. That's dedication. Placing God above all else, including self, in pursuit of his agenda. Placing God above all else, including yourself the man that puts himself first will come last but placing god first 
above all else, including yourself, is simply what we refer to as dedication. Matthew 6 and verse 33. We are familiar with this scripture in this commission. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first, not second, but first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added. So God makes it absolutely clear that for you to get the best out of your walk with him, you must seek him first. That's dedication. It's all about putting God first above all else, including self, demoting self to promote God, stooping down in order to lift God up. That is what we refer to as dedication. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. If you look at what the scripture tells us in the book of Daniel chapter 3, we come across the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We are told, after they were confronted with the fiery furnace, from verse 17 all the way down to verse 28, the Bible says there, they said, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. He said, but if not, be it known to thee that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Our God is able. Our God will deliver us. But notice that even if he does not, we will not bow. In other words, we are not interested as much just in what he will do for us. We are more interested in our commitment to him. You see, your commitment to God determines God's commitment to you. The more committed you are, the more dedicated you are, the more prominent you give to him, prominence you give to him, the more priority he gives to you. Shout hallelujah. I said shout hallelujah. I said shout hallelujah. That is the secret of dedication. So dedication brings you to a place where you are able to gain priority with God on the basis of your commitment to him. Why? Because he have become, you have made him first to you and therefore he makes you a priority to him. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Have you not observed that there are people that because of their work with God, they seem to have a priority with God. They seem to have a priority with God. They call unto God and God responds with speed unto them. And we know that it is faith that makes prayer to answer. But that faith must be rooted in dedication. I've shared many times how in the year 2008 in December, I cannot forget God's servant, our father was were in a certain place and he looked at me and said, David, I know God hears me when I pray. It was just a conversation. And out of that conversation came that statement. I know God hears me when I pray. I said, yes, sir. And I went back to my room and I began to think to myself, look at the confidence with which he's saying, I, I know God hears me when I pray. Now, the truth is, most Christians pray because they intend for God to hear them, but they are not sure whether he will hear them. But when you have dedicated yourself to God, you know that you have a priority with God. The, the phone call doesn't ring twice on God's table. When they call, I will answer. There are those who the scripture says, before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will say, here I am. In other words, I will not send the response. I will appear on their behalf. I see somebody here joining that company today. Yeah. You believe you are the one saying louder, amen. Yeah. I said, you believe you are the one saying louder, amen. amen. Placing God above all else, including self, is dedication. Number three, it is being consumed by the cause of the kingdom. Being consumed, swallowed up by the cause of the kingdom. When a man or woman is dedicated, they are consumed 
by the cause of the kingdom. You discover that any time a seed is planted, everything that makes that seed to grow is from the place that it is planted. In other words, the seed is consuming the contents of the ground. If what concerns God does not consume you, you are not dedicated. We must be consumed. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 2 and verse 17, it said there concerning Jesus, it said the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. It has consumed me. It has swallowed me. I am in it and it is in me. We must be consumed by the matters of the kingdom. That is the proof of our dedication. Where that is absent, we cannot claim to be dedicated. So dedication is about being consumed. Look at what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and verse 14. This is Paul speaking here and giving us an example from his own life experience. He said there, he said that having forgotten the things that are behind, he said, and pressing for the things that are before. Look at verse 14. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God. There are things behind me. I've left them alone. There is only one thing in front of me, the mark of the prize. I am consumed by it. That is my focus. That is my pursuit. I'm not distracted. I'm sharp in my focus. That is one of the vital requirements to see your faith working. When you allow the matters of God to swallow you up, as it were, to consume you, as it were, then you are positioning your faith to work. I see each one of us here today receiving a fresh baptism of this dedication in the name of Jesus. Amen. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. amen. I said, somebody believe it, say louder, amen. amen. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. amen. Number four, what is dedication? It is being unwavering in our commitment. Unwavering in our commitment to God and the affairs of his kingdom. Being unwavering in our commitment to God and the affairs of his kingdom. Being unwavering in our commitment to God and to the affairs of his kingdom. We see in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, we are told there, he said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Be steadfast, be unmovable, don't shift ground. You don't find a tree that keeps changing location. Every tree remains firm, planted where it has been located. If you are going to make much of your work with God, you must be unwavering in your commitment. Don't let situations change your commitment. There are people who pray, Lord, give me this. And when that thing comes, they pull back a bit into convenience. Lord, give me this. And when it comes, they pull back. Give me a husband, Lord. And when the husband comes, you pull back in your commitment. Why are you no more committed? Because I'm taking care of my husband. Lord, give me children. And when the child comes, why are you no more commitment? I have to take care of my children. You see, what begins, what we must recognize is this. Our commitment is not permitted to waver. The moment it wavers, it is, the, it is a pointer to the fact that we are not dedicated. Any tree that will remain relevant must stay planted in the same vein if you are going to make much out of your work with God you must remain planted and committed don't shake in your commitment to God we heard in the first in the teaching um, God's servant Bishop David Abiyo you mentioned how that 40 years ago he began following 40 years this coming January 40 years ago unbroken followership that is what you call refusing to waver there are many winds that may blow in your time of following God, but remain planted. Refuse to shake. Don't let anything negotiate your commitment. One thing I've discovered is that Satan will always suggest negotiation of your commitment. When Egypt was, Israel was to come out of Egypt, Pharaoh said, 
go, but leave your wives. Leave your herds. Leave your children. They said, no, we are going all together. Later I said, no, take your wives, take your children, but leave your cattle. Satan is always looking at how to negotiate how far you will go in your service to God. How far will you will go. That's why you find people most of the time. You say, think about it. When a person begins to get so committed in pursuing God, or people begin to complain, is it not too much? You are going to church too much. Now, if you are not going to church, there's no concern. But when you start going to church, as long as you are mediocre, there is no problem. You go once a week, no problem. But you start going to covenant hour every morning. Is it not too much? You are going to midweek service again. Is it not too much? Outreach is coming up. You are going to outreach again. Is it not too much? Are you the only one? This is too much for a person to do. Should you not take time and rest? Should you not take time and relax? People are trying to sound as the voice of Satan negotiating your commitment. Hear this and hear it very well. When Satan wants to speak, he uses many times the voice of men. He uses the voice of men to negotiate your commitment. We must be cautious, refusing to waver. I remember the testimony of a family who had an instruction concerning going out, soul winning. They had their baby in the hospital. The baby as it was, was dying. But when that instruction came, they dived out. As soon as they stepped out in obedience to God, by the time they came back, the child was sitting up. Totally well, discharged the same day. Why? Because your faith will walk on the platform of your dedication. I see grace for dedication coming upon you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Somebody believe it, say it louder, amen. amen. I see that grace for dedication coming upon you in the name of Jesus. Amen. What are we saying therefore? When you are dedicated, you provoke the virtues of your faith to deliver supernaturally. Now, in conclusion, what does dedicated faith produce? What becomes of one that engages faith in dedication? Number one product is glorification. You cannot be dedicated and not enjoy glorification. He said, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. But when it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. It will come forth, it will produce results. From this shiloh onwards, your faith will produce results. <laughs> Number two is favor, unusual favor. Why? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things shall be added. You won't run after them, they will run after you. People are running after blessing, running after breakthroughs, running after all manner of things. God is saying, run after me. Breakthrough will run after you. Your husband will run after you. Everything that you are looking for will run after you. Your miracle children will run after you. Your open doors will run after you. I see that becoming somebody's experience here in the name of Jesus. <laughs> what God is saying to us therefore is this. Don't just describe your faith. Be dedicated for your faith to work. Don't just claim I have faith. Prove your faith by your dedication. And as you do, God will change your story. Somebody believe, say a loud amen. amen. Will you lift your right hand to heaven now? Lord, I receive grace to put your word to work as I've received it this morning. I receive grace to put your word to work as I've received it this morning. I receive grace to put your word to work as I have received it this morning. Thank you, Lord.